SCR 52, Senator Clater memorialized the Congress to call a constitutional convention for the purpose of proposing amendments to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this is the same resolution that we've had, uh, we had last year, we passed it out of here. What this resolution does is it calls um, on, if we get together, the state of Louisiana gets together with 33 other states, 34 states, we can call a convention of states to propose amendments to the Constitution. The resolution that we have written limits it to three specific instances to um, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, impose fiscal restraints upon its activities, and limit the terms of office that may be served by officials and members of Congress. Uh, I think everybody knows about the, the problem that we have with runaway spending in, in D.C., and this is the way that the founders of this country decided would be best for the states to handle problems like this. They gave us this tool to get together, 34 states, to propose amendments, and if we do, and we're able to agree on an amendment, then uh, we would be able to possibly amend the Constitution if there's problems like we've been seeing. There are three protections that b basically ensure that we won't have any unintended consequences from this. Number one, the call is very specific. I just read the, the call to you. Um, 30, again, 34 states have to agree upon the call. Once the call is, is implemented, then that's what we're limited to hearing proposed amendments on. Number two, um, we would need um, a very specific, hold on one second, I draw, draw my thoughts together here. Number two, um, anything that comes out of this uh, proposed, any proposed amendments would have to be voted on and rat ratified by three quarters of the states. So that's a very high bar. It means that only 13 states could get together to block anything that we propose. I think that we need this at this time. If, you've, uh, if you remember the debate from last year, it was a very robust, robust debate. And I really believe that this is the right thing for us to do and for us to participate with to try to solve some of the problems that we see going on in Washington, D.C. And with that, I will take questions. Representative Garofalo, there's a number of questions and we have amendments. I don't, oh, they're not I, I don't have any it. amendments. All right. Mr. Let's do the questions first. Representative Dana Hay for a question. Representative Garofalo, you said we passed this out last year? Yes, Representative Dana Hay. And it went through the whole process, correct? No, it went through, we, we passed it out of the House. Okay, and did not pass out of the Senate? Did not pass out of the Senate, okay. correct. How many instruments of this nature have been passed by this legislature in the past? I uh, can't give you a definite number, but I know that we've passed a balanced budget amendment uh, resol uh, resolution calling for a convention If of I states. remember correctly and in your testimony in, in committee, it was over 20. And I, I, I'll take your word for that. I, okay. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. You, and you don't know what the subject matter was in each one of these? It would be probably different in each one, but the, the deal with this one is that there's a, a national movement right now that's moving. We have six states so far that have signed on. And w when you go to aggregate the calls for a convention, the calls have to be very specifically on the same subject. So we have six states that have passed this identical resolution. There are many others that are in the process of passing it at this point, but we have to keep it in this format so that we can, when we aggregate, they'll all be on the same subject. And I th uh, you, know, you mentioned that the call in the call, the three things that are in this resolution, limit the power of jurisdiction of the federal government, impose fiscal restraints upon its activities, and the term of limits uh, of office. Is that correct? Y yes, sir. That's the three items of call? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, could you explain a little bit on um, what the limit, the power, and jurisdiction of the federal government is? Well, basically anything that would reduce spending, reduce uh, the, the way that the, the federal government imposes mandates, in many cases unfunded mandates, on the states. Is this language, vague language, that stands for or would be lead to a, um, lead to a countermand amendment? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Would this language, is this vague language to lead to a countermand amendment? That's not our intention. There's a countermand amendment mo mo uh, movement that is occurring right now. They have approached me and asked me to carry their resolution. I refuse to carry that resolution. 
Um, so I, I can't really address where they are with their movement, but this is not that movement. Okay, so this language is not, uh, uh, does not um, uh, lead to a counterman amendment. It, it doesn't call for that. I, I believe that given this language, if we get to a convention that we could consider that, but again, that's not what this is calling for, and that's not the intention. Okay, and, and with that, that, that line of uh, thinking, consideration of amendments, once you get to that constitutional convention, then just about anything could be no, brought forth. It's, only, it's limited, again, it's limited by the scope of the call, which you've already read. It's limited by when, when we appoint, when the state of Louisiana appoints the ambassadors, they're truly ambassadors to this convention. When we appoint the um, ambassadors, we actually have a pa to pass a piece of legislation for that appointment. In that piece of legislation, we will determine a charge for these ambassadors. If they go beyond the scope of their charge, we can immediately recall them to the state so that the, it virtually prevents any for the, our ambassadors from going beyond the scope of their charge. And maybe not in this state, but we will have that, that instruction and that charge, but other states, therefore, possibly could do just the same. Sure, they but could, again, then you have the, forth anything you, you have the third hurdle of three-quarter ratification, in which case, again, only 13 states could prevent any of these issues from becoming law. Okay. How are the delegates going to be chosen? That's up to us. We have to pass, as I so just we said. Don't, we, we have don't to have no, anything like no, that. No, we do. We have, to, we have to pass this house, this, this legislature has to pass a separate piece of legislation deciding exactly how that selection process will be determined. How come we don't have that now if we're going to do this? Well, I'm doing first step first. I'm taking Well, I would think they'd go co coincide. Well, that's going to be a very heavy lift as well. And before we, quite honestly, before I went through all the work of, of writing that piece of legislation, I said, Let, let's do the, the amendment, I mean, the uh, resolution first to make sure that we're willing to participate at the table with the other, with the other states. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Danahay. For our question, Representative Edmonds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Garofalo. My neighbor. Yes. Thank you for your good work. Um, and your explanation has been good. But I want to make certain, just in this process, because it is a um, unique process that we don't experience very much. And back to these um, issues, you said three of those, and you're, you seem to be very confident that this sort of, I'll put it in layman's terms, uh, keeps it, this group from being a runaway train, so to speak. That's what everybody's, I think, has concerns Look, about. It, it's virtually impossible, Representative Edmonds. There's been some writings, there are some scholars, and I think there's a note on your desk that actually says, pardon me, <coughs> there are a group of scholars who believe that this call cannot be limited. They're in the very small minority. The vast majority of the scholars who have written on, and I've done the independent research myself, who have written on this type of a, a, a convention of states, are all, uh, the vast majority are in agreement that we can limit the scope of the call, and the convention cannot go beyond the scope of that. But again, there are two other safety checks. We can, when we decide how our delegates are going to be selected, we can give specific charge, and we, we, are, we should give specific charge as to what exactly our delegates can deal with. And thirdly, the highest bar is the ratification process. You need three quarters of the states. Again, only 13 states have to get together and say they don't like something. And that, to me, is a very high burden to meet. But again, you know, in researching this, Rob Nadelson is the preeminent constitutional scholar who I follow. Michael Farris is the leader of this movement. They are both very, very well respected. Michael Farris, in his, in his case, he was the founder of Patrick Henry College. Rob Nadelson has been practicing before, and both of them have been practicing before the Supreme Court for years. And they are both firmly, they, they, they have, have assured us that based on their research, we can limit the scope of the convention by our call. It seems as if, did you know, that that 13-state ratification process would be the most stringent of them all. Extremely high bar, as it should be. Yeah. Uh, let me ask this one final thing, and that is, so once the work is done by the convention and they have come to an agreement, and let's just say that it's, something has been ratified, would it then be sent uh, to, to Congress? Would there be involvement? Do the states have to go back through any other process 
if you could just walk me through that. Yeah, as, I, as I understand it, and I'm not an expert in this area, but as I understand it, the process is if, if, if the convention has an amendment that they agree on, and again, they, they have to agree on it, that they would like to propose, once they're done with their work, they would submit that to Congress. Congress selects the ratification method. Once they select the ratification method, then it comes back to the states for ratification. It seems as if, did you know, that once the nation of here we've grown for these over 200 years, that when we do have issues that we can't resolve, it seems like this is a, a, a really strong instrument, although heavy lifting, as you've described. It, it is the to, only tool that the states have to propose amendments to the Constitution. And I believe James Madison, in his wisdom, included this in Article 5 for exactly this purpose. When we see, let me not use too many adjectives, when we see what's going on in, Bat in uh, D.C. going on, and we as state legislators believe that we have to do something to try to curb that, this is the tool that they gave us to, to enact that change. Well, it's a great balance of uh, states' rights has always been a part of our heritage, and we are that independent republic, and we should act like that. It seems, did you know, that this would be that opportunity to help us get back on track? I did know that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For a question, Representative Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. How many states do you say have to ratify this in order for this to happen? 34. 34. Oh, I'm sorry. Ratification? Ratification is 38. Occurred, I'm sorry? Uh, in order for the convention to actually... That's 34 states. Two-thirds of the states have to agree and, and have the same resolution so that um, when they're aggregated and all put together, it has to be on the same and, topic. And do you have the names of the states that have already done this? I don't have the list with me, uh, but there are six states that have passed it, and it's in the process six. and several other, yes. Okay. We've been working on it for three years, and again, it's going to take a while to get the states together, but um, this really only started two years ago. But I, I just needed to know the number and what states. If, uh, is, it, is there somewhere we can find the number of states? If you go to convention, conventionofstates.com or is it .org, if you Google Convention of States, that website will come up, and there's a lot of information on there. There's some videos that will explain the whole process and, to and you. And my question is this. Um, there are some uh, amendments to the Constitution that deal with, um, I guess, discrimination, things of that sort. So when you open that up, those could actually be repealed as well, could they not? Right. Again, it, it's our contention that, that that's impossible because we're not, that's not within the scope of the call. When we send our ambassadors to the convention, that will not be in their charge. And for ratification purposes, it would be virtually impossible to get any amendment dealing with the sec uh, any proposed amendment that would do anything to the Second Amendment, to the First Amendment. Those types of, of issues, those, the, it would be virtually impossible to get agreement from three quarters of the states on changing anything like that. So the information you just sent out has more information on Second Amendment than it does anything else. So are you looking at... Uh, I, I didn't send anything out, so I, I don't know what you're was, referring to. It was passed out at your request, uh, Philip. You put my name on it? Yes. Okay. There, there are two pieces. There's, there, I, I've well, seen I them. I did it to put your name on it. I, I, I didn't. Well, but that's <laughs> did okay. Did you give him permission? Representative <laughs> Ivey did it for me, and, and I didn't realize he was trying to do me a favor. Uh, okay. From what I understand, there were two pieces. One of them is a frequently asked questions piece, and the second one is dealing, the NRA is actually, because there's another group, gun rights group, that has raised some questions. The NRA has come out and said, no, this won't interfere with the Second Amendment. They're convinced. That's what that piece is that's dealing with. That's what that piece is doing. All right. Thank you. I, I just discarded it. I didn't read it. Thank you. I, I couldn't hear what you said, Representative Smith, but thank you for the question. For a question, Representative Marcel. Thank you. Uh, my question, I heard you talk about the ratification process. Can you explain that to me a little bit more? You, three quarters of the states have to ratify any proposed amendments to the Constitution, which means that only 13 states, you need 38 states to agree that that amendment should be on the Constitution. So only 13 states have to say no, and it doesn't go on. Okay. How many delegates uh, are we going to send each state? Well, that's up to each state. And from what I'm hearing so far, most states are looking at around five delegates. Okay. 
So how do we select those delegates? That's up to us. And what, what I intend to do once we get this out is uh, I'm going to look at the, what the other states are doing. I'll write a piece of legislation that would be proposed legislation on delegate selection and delegate charge. And then I would distribute that just like we do with any other bill. And, and you mentioned delegates charge. So how do we keep the politics out of the delegates charge? Well, there's going to be politics in, involved all the way around. But basically what we do is we put in that piece of legislation that we don't want our delegates to do, deal with anything to do with abortion. We don't want our delegates to deal with anything to do with gay rights. It, when, when that type of thing happens, it, it, they're charged, they're limited by that piece of legislation and their charges, they can't do anything. And once they do, they've exceeded the scope of their ambassadorship and they're immediately recalled to the state of Louisiana. Okay, and what is the scope of their ambassadorship? We, again, we have to set that. We will set that so, via so that second piece of legislation. So what you're asking us to do, I believe, is premature with all of, all of that information. We have, to, we have to call the convention first. Well, what you're asking us to do is pass this legislation and, for trust, Louisiana. and trust that we're going to, who's going to form the scope and the questions and the call. It's a lot of unanswered questions. Well, I, I would posit picked. this, Representative Marcel, if we can't if we can't piece a, pass a piece of legislation that determines the selection process for delegates, we won't have delegates. And then Louisiana won't be represented at the table. Yeah. So, I, I mean, we, we, we'll have to beat each other up and go back and forth about what we want included and who's going to be, how the delegates are going to be selected. Okay. But again, I believe that we should be a part of the process, and that's one of the reasons why I've been fighting for this. Which amendments are we looking to change in the Constitution? You talked about several that would not be in the scope. Which ones are we looking to change? Is well, there some idea? The biggest thing that I am in favor of is a balanced budget amendment so that we can limit the spending in the federal government. Right now, as we stand here, this country is almost $20 trillion in debt. $20 trillion, that's a number that's hard for anybody. It's hard for me to conceive of $20 trillion. That, to me, is a national security issue. That, to me, is mortgaging our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. The, we have, are putting them at a significant disadvantage. It's putting this country at a disadvantage when it comes to our creditors possibly calling those loans. And we have to do something to stop the runaway spending in Washington, D.C. And this is the tool that the founders gave us to do it. Okay. You talked about things that would not be in that call. Uh, you talked about, uh, I think you said, uh, nothing about the LGBT or... Right, and again, that's not in the scope that we're, uh, of this resolution, so those issues are off the table, but we and could specifically... What about voters', voters rights? We could specifically include that in the second piece of legislation in, in the charge for our delegates. We, we've, we could do that, but we have not done that because we've not developed our We scope. haven't gotten to that point in the process yet. Okay, that, you know, those are the kind of things that would concern me, the voters' rights and discrimination. I think that would concern all those, of us. Those types I, of I, things. Absolutely, and I, and I agree with you. I would not want to leave that up to, you know, And, and that's no not call. in the call. That's not in the call. Not in the call. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There are no other questions. I think we have some amendments. Mr. Clerk. Representative Danahay has an amendment, Mr. Speaker. It is 4795, available on the computer. Representative Danahay, on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, um, staying within the spirit of our, our um, founding fathers, I want to offer this amendment. And simply what it does, it says that any change to the Bill of Rights is hereby excluding the application to the United States Congress for the calling of the convention. And that's all it does. It, ins it ensures our personal liberties that were given to us in the first 10 amendments in the Bill of Rights. For a question on the amendment, Representative Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I take it uh, you like the amendment? Do what? I think that you like the amendment. I, I do like the amendment. Thank where you. are you putting uh, what lang Where are you putting that language? Sure. In it, since I don't have a copy in okay. front of me. Okay. Um, on page one of the resolution, at the end of line five, the first amendment would to insert the following: 
and to exclude from the purpose of the Constitutional Convention any changes to the Bill of Rights. And then on page two, at the end of line four, it would, uh, and we'd insert and, and then between lines four and five, we would insert whereas during the debates on the adoption of the Constitution of the United States of America, opponents repeatedly charged that the Constitution is, was, is as drafted would open the way to tyranny by the central government and demand a Bill of Rights that would spell out the immunities of individual citizens. Whereas the first 10 amendments to the Constitution of the United States comprise the Bill of Rights, and many believe that the Bill of Rights was necess necessary to ensure the acceptance of the Constitution, and that these rights are critical to the freedom and rights of all citizens of the United States should remain inviolable. Okay. Do you know, with regard to the requirement for uniform and enabling language, do you know if this uh, interferes with any of the required uniform language? I have no idea, but I think this is much necessary. I do not want this thing to take place and somebody start to mess with the Bill of Rights, our I, I individual liberties. I would not disagree with that at all. Thank you. Our question on the amendment, Representative Talbot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So hit this again because I had a lot of noise coming through. Sure. This is saying that no one can touch the Bill of Rights. That's correct. When, okay. we, Which, when we make application to the U.S. Congress for the convention, that we, we will exclude the, any ability to change the Bill of Rights. I understand that, and I don't think there's anyone in well, government in, in all the 50 states that would ever want to change the Bill of Rights. I'm glad but to doesn't hear that. that, I guess, to, to, to play devil's advocate, isn't that the very nature of a democracy? If three quarters of the states get together and for whatever crazy reason want to do that, which they never would, I mean, that's like. I just don't know if it's necessary. I mean, you're going to have It's three, not necessary? You're We're going to call a constitutional convention, and anything could be changed, contrary to what has been said here, then somebody's going to be able to change something in the Bill of Rights? But you've got three, three fourths I don't want of to take states. that. I don't want to take that chance. I know, I know what you're trying to do, but I just don't know if it's... You've got three-fourths of the states would have to agree to that. I mean, that's... Oh, so? Okay, I mean, but I, I just think, is this, a, is this a poison pill for this? No, it is not. To my knowledge, it's not. I well, think it's, it's an I, insurance I that I'm protect kind of our, our individual liberties. Well, I understand that, and that's why we have rules, and that's why we have laws, and that's why Congress can, can make amendments to the Constitution and so on. But now, I, this I just, is only in our application, the state of Louisiana's application to the, to the U.S. Congress. Are you going to vote for this if your amendment passes? I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, that sounds like a poison pill yeah. to me. Yes, I will. Okay, good. Thank you. There are no other questions on the amendment. Is there any objection to the adoption of the amendment? Representative Garofalo, on your objection. Members, as I've already alluded to, we have to aggregate with the other 30, 33 states to call a convention. If we change this, we will not aggregate. So it's worthless. We have to have the exact same language by Representative Danahay trying to change this language. Representative Talbot is correct. It's a poison pill. We will not be a part of the process. So I object. Representative Johnson, is your question for Representative Garofalo? Representative Garofalo, Representative Mike Johnson has a question for you. Representative Garofalo, this. I understand the intention is, is well, uh, but, and you've articulated well that this would be a poison pill. Do you know how many years have gone into the other states who've already signed on? How many years have gone into that effort? Two to three at this point. And, and prior to that actual effort initiating, are you aware that the scholars involved in this, who happen to be some of my heroes in constitutional law, put a lot of groundwork and effort into the study of what that effort would look like. Actually, I was aware of that. And when you read their writings, when you read Rob Nadelson's writings, Mark Meckler's writings, and Michael Farris's writings, it's obvious that they've done a lot of research into this. And that's one of the issues that we've run into. There have been, as Representative Danahay already pointed out, this state has passed several of these calling of convention of states, Article 5 type resolutions. 
many states have passed several of these. The problem is that they don't aggregate. They, don't, they aren't the same. And if you don't have the same language, you don't get to 34 states. So the same process happens all the time. They try to change the language. Once the language is changed, we're out. And, and that's not just a rule we came up with. That comes from Article 5 of the, of the Federal Constitution. Correct. The, 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 the intent, our intent, and the intent of the other 33 states has to be clear. And this is clear. So however well intended, and I take Representative Dan Hay at his word because I have high regard for him, and his intellect, as a defender of the Bill of Rights for the last 20 years, I would be opposed to the amendment. Did you know? Because I, I would fear that Louisiana would be out on its own beginning an entirely new effort instead of joining on with the other states who have already done the heavy lift and the, and the good work. Well, and certainly, as I've already said, we can address some of those issues in the charge to our delegates. Thank you. There are no other questions. Representative Danahay, you have a right to close on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To Representative Johnson, uh, assertion of how many, how long that this this is this movement has been going on. Well, the Bill of Rights have withstood any challenge for over 200 years, and now we're going to have the opportunity. I, you know, I've been here for nine years, and I in the, never in my lifetime would I ever dream that somebody would object to the protection of the Bill of Rights. So I, I just don't can't stand here and say that this is not not worthy or not uh, needed in what we're debating here. And I think that the, bill, the protection of the Bill of Rights is utmost by this body. And I think that this, this amendment will take care of that. So I ask you a favorable passage. Representative Danahay has offered an amendment to which Representative Garofalo has objected. When the clerk opens the machines, if you're in favor of Representative Danahay's amendment, vote yes. If you're opposed, vote no. And the clerk will open the machine. Vote your machines, members. Vote your machines. Representative Falcon or no. Representative Hunter no. Representative Huval no. Representative Davis no. Representative Nancy Landry no. Representative Henry no. Representative Lance Harris no. Representative Hinchkins no. Representative Wilmot no. Representative Hoffman no. Are you through voting members? Representative Arms yes. Representative Norton no. Are you through voting? Clerk will close the machine. 41 yeas and 51 nays, and the amendment fails to pass. Next amendment. By Representative Gary Carter. It is two pages in length, been distributed 4668. Representative Carter, on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of the legislature, when this proposal came before the judicial, I mean, before the House and Governmental Affairs Committee, there was testimony given that there was concern about the language at the convention on page one, lines two and three, that the call of a constitutional convention for the purpose of proposing amendments to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. There was testimony that that language is so broad that it can undo the vast majority of the United States Constitution. And many of the rights that's part of this Constitution, the, the Bill of Rights that was just spoken to, by Representative Danahay, as well as the 13th Amendment that ended slavery, the 14th Amendment that extended equal protection, the 15th Amendment that extended the right to vote to former slaves, and the 19th Amendment that extended women's suffrage were hard-fought amendments to the United States Constitution. And so my amendment excludes from the purposes of this constitutional convention that is, propo that is proposed here any change to section one of the 13th amendment that provides neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States of America. Our section one of 14th amendment which provides all persons born or naturalized in the United States as subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within his jurisdiction the equal protection of his laws. Members, we fought a war over these constitutional amendments. 
as well as the 15th Amendment that provides the rights of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And finally, the 19th Amendment, which extended suffrage to women, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States by, or by any state on account of sex. So as there is a call to go into a constitutional convention dealing with the scope and powers of the federal constitution, let's make certain that these fundamental principles of freedom, of life and liberty, and justice and equal protection of the laws, as well as the fundamental right to vote, are protected. And so for this reason, I ask for favorable passage of this amendment. For a question on the amendment, Representative Mike Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just a quick question. Are, you are aware that this is another poison pill amendment, right? It is not, sir. Well, did you understand you, that these are fundamental rights that is found to the fundamental bedrock of this United States? No, and I don't so, disagree. And, Look, so I don't, to, and so to object or vote against the amendments, I, I think sends the wrong message of who we are and what we believe in. I don't believe it's a poisonous pill to say that if we're going to play around with the language of the United States Constitution, let's make certain that there's, that, that there's language saying that slavery shall never again exist. Let's make certain that there's equal protection of the laws and that everyone who's a citizen of these states have the right to vote. That I, those are fundamental bases that if we're going to go forward with this, let's make sure that that foundation is there. Are you aware that I agree, I'm sure Representative Garofalo and everyone in this room agrees that those freedoms guaranteed under those amendments are sacrosanct and they should not be touched. Well, However, let's, let's put words into action so we can say that well, those are amendments, that, we, that, that those, that's language that we agree to, but you can say it or you can do something about it and vote in such a way to say that I stand by this, these amendments, I stand by that, this language. Not, so right. even though I say what may be helpful, I'm going to vote in a way that shows how much I'm committed to this language. I appreciate your passion. and. It, but, but are you aware that the vote on this amendment is not an up or down vote on whether we agree with the amendments that you've cited? The, this vote, the reason I asked about it being a poison pill, is to determine whether this resolution goes forward. Are you aware that if this resolution does not go forward in its present posture, then it will effectively have no effect, that Louisiana will not join in with the other states that are going for the convention, and that we will be out on our own. Are you, you are aware of that, right? I, I am not, because I haven't read what the other states are doing. But let me right. ask you a question. I, I've enjoyed practicing law with you. I mean, practicing in this body with you. <laughs> you consider yourself a constitutional scholar, and I respect that. And looking at Article 5 of the Constitution, that if we shall call, go into a constitutional convention, we're trying to set it up by we will have limitations in terms of what that constitutional convention will look like. Well, do you know that if you look at Article 5 of the, of the United States Constitution, Section 1, the moment we enter into a call, then Congress shall call. Congress shall be the one to appoint the delegates. Once we is called, we lose, con lose control by the... P You're shaking your head. Let me read it for you. Article 1... Article 5 of the, of the United States Constitution states the Congress, the Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to the Constitution, or on the application of the legislature, legislators of two-thirds of the several states, that's this provision, shall call. Not may, shall call. Congress shall call. So I think it's important that we send a message that if we're going to go down this slope of the states, the, the various legislators of two-thirds of the states shall call this constitution, to this constitutional convention. Let's make certain that we have language in here saying that there are some things we consider so precious, some things we fought over so hard that represents a certain part of our history that we are above and beyond. Let's make sure this language is included in it. Well, uh, are you aware that the, the text that you just read of Article 5 allows and, uh, and gives Congress the authority to call the convention, that's correct, but not to dictate what happens if the sufficient number of states have gotten together to call the convention. Are you, are you aware, aware of that? I disagree with that interpretation. Okay, well, you, your interpretation is different than rooms full of constitutional no, no, scholars. No, no, okay. let's, no, it's in that paragraph, right? So that was the first sentence of Article 5. Mm -hmm. So if we continue reading that... 
this is the limitation that Congress shall have in terms of any, um, any changes to the Constitution. It's the very last clause. Provided that no amendment which made, which shall be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article. That one no longer applies because we're past that date. And here's the second one that does apply. Semicolon, and that no state, comma, without its consent, shall deprive of its equal suffrage in the Senate. So you as a constitutional scholar, and me as someone who, who did all right in constitutional law, can tell you that that language means that the only amendment that will be off limits will be a limit to say that the United States Senate must be made up of two senators from each of the various states. There are no other limitations. Congress shall call it, and this is the only limitation that Congress shall have. So let's send a clear message here that, listen, if we're going to go down this path of calling it, let's have the states agree. And I know that other states must agree to the language that we have. Let's have a fundamental agreement that we shall have no law sanctioning slavery. We shall have no law that takes away from equal protection. Let's have no law that abridge the right of people like myself to vote. Or have no law that can take away the right of vote of women in these United States of America. Well, yeah. We, we don't have time or no, the inclination to have an argument about the meaning of the Article 5. But I, all I wanted to, acknowledge, to, to get you to acknowledge is that if your amendment is, uh, is adopted, then this, this uh, it's resolution. It's not about whether or not we have some procedure. Okay. It, 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 with all due respect, I hear what you're saying. And, and, and I know my representative here is going to say the same thing. That listen, we have to be so careful to have the language right so as to we can have language that agrees with other states. What I am suggesting to you, forget the process. We have to make sure the principles are right before we move forward we on legislation. Before on the we move, move forward on legislation. Let's make certain that we have language that protect what it is we fought for. The, the protection is provided within the scope of Article 5. The protection it's, is provided in the 13th the Amendment, the 14th okay. Amendment. I'm sorry, I'm not going to cut you off. I'm not doing that on purpose. No, no, I know. No, it, it's, I, I respect you. And I, did you know that I share your passion for all of the, uh, well, the, show the principles me by your vote. that you are? But, but, I, but I do not believe, I do not believe I, that, I, that, I, that the, I, the uh, concern you've stated is valid. So thank you. For a question on the amendment, Representative Norton. Oh, that's what I said too when y'all was up there talking. Oh, I didn't say anything. <laughs> Not you, whoever said it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> this is about women right to vote. I hope y'all know Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you. The 19th Amendment that gives women the right to vote. Representative Carter, tell me, I, I heard some of what you were saying a few minutes ago. Why do you think this amendment here is so important for this bill today that you're bringing? Because I think it's absolutely important that we never, ever go into a place where women cannot vote in this country. That slavery is possible in this country. That everyone doesn't have the right to equal protection of the laws and that citizens of this United States have the right to vote. I think that those are fundamental freedoms that form the foundation of this nation, that we must do everything in our power to make sure we protect and fight for them every step of the way. And making sure we have magic language that fits into some process, I think that is secondary to the principles by which we should be always fighting for and cognizant of as we serve in this body. And you know, um, I'm, I'm really amazed at, what, amazed at what you said, because you know the other day, someone told me back in 1776, that all men and women were created equal. And I believe without a doubt in 1976, 1776, I was not even born. But <laughs> I know without a doubt that women were not voting in 1776. They were not voting then. They were not even thought of for half a second to be given the opportunity to vote. And when I think about your amendment today, and I think about, we are not even able to get equal pay as women. We're not. But when I think about what we face and how hard we work as women and how, how much we work to make sure that everyone else's jobs are done and we are in the back, it tells me that we still have a long ways to go. But one thing that I do believe 
it has to start somewhere. And I believe your amendment would be the beginning of that. Thank and you. I want to thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, we do have a long way to go, but you know what we shall never, ever do? We should never lose the rights that we fought so hard to get. Absolutely. We fought a war for the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment. Think of what women had to go through in order to get the right to vote. And we're going to put that in jeopardy in order to comply with some process? Well, well you know, not I'm, I'm a little bit concerned when whoever it may be I may think of the fact of putting women in jeopardy of not being able to exercise their right. That's a dangerous move. That's a dangerous move because I don't believe that this country can exist without the support of women. I agree. And I want to let you know that I support your amendment. You Thank have you. a good amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For a question on the amendment, Representative Ivey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, why do you suppose our founders put that language in the bill? I don't in, believe in the, the, in the Constitution. The, I don't believe the founders put in a 13th, 14th, 15th, or no, 19th what, Amendment. What I'm, the ability to amend the Constitution. Why do you think they put that in there to begin with? Well, it, I have. What if they gone, said, "There's no look. This but, is it. We're done. This is not. You can't change it." Well, I'm, I'm, I, let me answer it a diff, different sort of ways. First, let me say I did not go back and read the Federalist Papers or the Anti-Federalist Papers to come to what was in their minds at the time it was drafted. I do know that when the nation was first founded, it was founded as we had a, a Articles of Confederation, if you might recall. And the con a Constitutional Convention was called at that time to better handle the scope of the Articles of, Conf of, of Confeder uh, Confederation. When that Constitutional Convention ended, and this is the only precedent by which we have, which makes this language so very important, you left the Articles of Confederation and ended up with the, with the United States Constitution that we have today. So if you look at the only precedent of this ever happening, what happens is you threw out the old body of law that governed us, and you ended up with a completely different document. And I'm so glad that we have the Constitution that allows it to be amended. So we have the Bill of Rights that was amended that, Absolutely. that Chairman Dan Hay, that, that so protected what you care about at, at UN McGass, the Second Amendment, and I respect that. I, I care about all the amendments. They're so all do I. just that, as important. And, and As you should. And so there is a process. So if, for instance, Representative Johnson or Representative Garofalo or any one of us want to offer an amendment and say, listen, we think it's a good idea to have a balanced budget amendment. You can offer a balanced budget amendment without offering what this is. This is a call of a constitutional convention for the purposes of limiting the federal government's jurisdiction and power. Once that magic language is used, that is sufficient enough, according to the people who showed up in our, our committee, and you were there, you may disagree with them, but this was their educated opinion on it, that that it opens up the entire Constitution. And if that's so, if that's so, mm -hmm. all I'm saying is, and I know you may disagree if that's so, all I'm suggesting is, if we're gonna open up Pandora's box and start looking at the Constitution, there are certain amendments that must always be protected. How we got these amendments must always be remembered. You pointed out, in that House and Governmental Affairs debate, that why would we ever touch the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments? We fought a war over it. You're absolutely sure. right. And I'm of opinion, well, if we fought a war over it, let's make sure we at least have it on as an amendment to say that no one can ever yeah. degrade them in any fashion. And my point was that fashion. it took a war because of a bunch of stiff-necked politicians in Washington, okay, who didn't want to see that all men were created equal, okay, and it took a war. With that said, okay, uh, we have a federal budget and a deficit and unfunded liabilities in the over a hundred trillion dollars. The I national debt is 19 trillion, okay, and climbing. And the un the entire unfunded liability is over a hundred trillion dollars today. And so my question is this, and it was posed in committee, okay. Uh, the only other means besides a, a calling of the states to be the fourth check and balance that our founding fathers so wisely put into the, the uh, Constitution, okay, it, there is, I have a better chance of winning the Powerball twice in, in a row than the federal government at, in Washington passing a balanced budget amendment with a two-thirds majority in both houses. OK, so our founding fathers had the wisdom to know that the states, if we come together for a specific purpose and goal, we, we could affect the Constitution of the United States. 
Now, can I respond right quick? Go ahead. And did you know, please? Did it, you know? It, but, but did you know that? You don't get to ask questions. I'm kidding. Well, yeah. let me respond this All way. All right. You mentioned the chances of you winning the lottery, the chances of you winning the lottery twice. Let me be clear. The amendments that freed my forefathers is not something I want to ever put at chance or at risk. This is language that ended slavery in the Can United Congress, States of America. Could Congress this is repeal language, those, like, law, uh, those amendments me, now? Representative Ivey, let me finish. Please so go. one, this is the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, and you know how we got those amendments. One. Representative Tebow, yes. why do you rise? Five minutes. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. State your point. Since we now have a Mr. Bagnaris in the chamber, can we have a Bagnaris rule? You are welcome to draw one up anytime. If that's what it'll take. <laughs> Thank you. If, Mr. Ivey, you want to have an amendment to deal with... Representative Robbie Carter, excuse me, gentlemen. Representative Robbie Carter, why do you rise? Five-minute rule. Is there any objection to the five-minute rule? No objection. Five-minute rule in effect. <laughs> Members, I remind you that's in effect for the rest of the proceedings today. It, Representative Proceed. Ivey, if you want to have an amendment to deal with the financial burdens of the federal government, you can propose that. What I'm suggesting is to go about it in a way that opens the whole United States Constitution up. Let's do it in a manner that protects what it is we fought so hard for. Hello? Okay. I didn't think it was a five-second rule. All right. Uh, <laughs> You, you mentioned uh, there, within the amendment process in Article 5, there is an ability for the states to get together and, and the, you say that Congress shall call. Yes. Now, if in, that, if in that call, does it specify that Congress shall select the delegates? Is that stated in Article 5 anywhere? It does not, but it, it doesn't say that Congress shall not. Right. Well, if the states petition Congress for the call then Congress makes the call. It'd be like having an open call for any meeting. Uh, you don't get to tell anyone specifically who can or can't that's, come. That's, and that's the purpose that's of the this. That's the state's rights. That's the purpose of this is there's so much uncertainty with the potential of a constitutional call. That's, let's make certain so that some of these principles that we hold so dear and true remain. Right. Last qu uh, two questions left. One. Oh, just please one. <laughs> okay. Did, do you believe that if an amendment to abolish, let's say, the right for women to vote. If that was proposed, I, first of all, I think it would be easier for us to pass equal pay for women in this body. And that okay? was giving me concern. So you're asking the question whether or not I think it's possible to have a vote that could take away wait, women's right know, to vote? Wait, you know, let me finish. It, do you think it would be possible? But is it possible, is it possible that okay, you have a this? body who does not vote for equal pay for women? Do you think that three-fourths of states would ratify such an amendment? You know, let's go. Let's stick back to the one that you were talking about earlier. The one that whether or not I think it's possible that someone would agree or the states could agree or that legislatures could pass a bill that could anywhere interfere or bridge the right of women to vote. That was your question. Is that really the question? <laughs> after after we did not pass equal pay, I mean, there are some things that we must it's, it's fight for every anyway. every step of the way. There are some things we must hold true and dear. Okay, and with, with that regard, since you mentioned the Second Amendment uh, earlier, you know, in the language it says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. You aware of that? Yes. Okay. So, do you, do you believe that requiring a permit to carry a firearm? Is infringement on those fundamental inalienable rights? I have honestly, I have not really studied the Second Amendment. It's, as some it's of the constitutional real simple lawyers. language. It's like any of the other ones with prohibitions and shall not be infringed. It's and very I, clear. And, and I, I was I'll be done with my questioning. Thank you. For a question on the amendment, Representative Talbot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gary, I'm with you 100%. But this is what you charge the delegates with. The, the, the convention is, the scope, I believe, is limited to three subjects. So that already can't, we can't address those issues in this scope. So this is what happens. We decide we want to participate in this convention of states. Which, by the way, I'm sure you're frustrated with Congress. Is that a yes? Oh, there are aspects, yes. I am too. So in order to change it, this is the only way we're going to change that process. So this is what happens. And I've studied this issue We've gone to seminars on it, all that stuff. 
we agree to participate in this convention. Then we choose delegates. Either they, either they get elected or we choose them through the legislature. But we go to those delegates and we say, all right, these amendments, untouchable. Every single one you're talking about, you cannot touch. And if you do touch, you're disqualified as a delegate and you're coming back home and we're going to send in a, uh alternate for your place. So I understand what you're doing, but this isn't the vehicle to do that. To do th- for one thing, it's not an open convention, so they can't, they can't do it anyway. That's the first stopgap measure. Second, we charge our delegates. You come down to the podium. You make all these things. It passes 105 to nothing, every single one of them. We only say, look, you're going up there for these specific areas, this, 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 and, and we'll all vote with you. Okay, can I respond very briefly? Yeah, yeah sure. It, and this is a wonderful conversation. That's, that's why I have concern of it. This is essentially the enabling legislation that allows for it. And you're right. It calls for three separate things. The very first one is the one that gives so much concern. The first one is to call a constitutional, to call a constitutional convention for the purpose of proposing amendments to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. It is that language. Right. Acca- wait, hear me okay, out. I'm sorry. I, I allowed you. It is that language, according to the LSU law professor, and constitutional law who appear before our committee that opens up Pandora's box to to essentially have a a runaway constitutional convention. And so, since you have that sort of language that opens everything up by limiting the powers of the jurisdiction of the federal government of being in play, we can also have language in here to say that you can't touch the 13th Amendment, you can't touch the 14th Amendment, you can't touch the 15th Amendment, and you can't touch women's suffrage. And right. if the concern is that other states don't agree, well, we should stand up and say any sort of call for Excuse constitutional Excuse me, Representative Carter, the gentleman is out of time, Representative Talbot. Can I give him two more minutes? Sure. It's, give me time the, to respond. It's, it's to say that whatever is called, this shall always be protected. Agreed. And where that comes in is when you assign the delegates to the constitution because if we go or to the convention if we go your way we'll never have a convention i think that professor's being a little disingenuous when saying he's it's almost like he's saying the mere fact that you're calling a convention of the states blows everything up that's not true but with this you, language is the concern but, but if you don't but that language kills kills this this, but, this the, no but, the language of to the, this language on line three for the purpose of proposing I mean, amendments to limit the power and jurisdiction of the Your argument could be that Article 5 in and of itself is bad because it could do this, this, and this. And I agree. We I'm don't s- want to have a runaway convention. And th- that's where we charge yeah. delegates with specific goals. If, and if they violate that, they're not a delegate anymore. They're off the jury. We send up an alternate. And the further stopgap is you've got to get three-quarters of the states There's a much better agree. way to do this. And a better way to do it without risking opening up a runaway constitutional, uh, without running away uh, open convention, is to say, hey, listen, we want a balanced budget amendment. We can pass a balanced budget amendment. And if other states agree, then you have, I don't know what number we're on, a 28th or whatever constitutional amendment we on. Here's another amendment to the United States Constitution to deal with Congress shall have a balanced budget or judicial term limits or whatever the, the issue might be, as opposed to saying we're going to have a constitutional convention call for the purpose of discussing the powers of the federal government, which possibly puts into play the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, the 19th Amendment, and all the other amendments that it, we fought, it, fought so hard still, for. They're still not in play unless we give our delegates the ability but, to even take up that amendment. So let's at least have the language that would preclude well, but, any delegate from but, even going to considering it. This will be my last point. If we do what you're saying, we're not going to be able to participate in this convention. I'm telling you there's stop gaps, but we'll just agree to disagree. I guess Perfect that's the Perfect timing. The gentleman is out of time. For a question, Representative Amity, Representative Amity, the gentleman is out of time. Do you agree to grant him two minutes? There is an objection to granting him additional time. Is there any objection? Without objection, two minutes, Representative Amity. Thank you, sir. Uh, Following along the lines of the questions that were just being discussed about how this call limits what the Constitutional Convention could do to um, discussion of limiting the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, imposing fiscal restraints upon its activities, and limiting the terms of office that may be served by its officials and members of Congress. I can barely hear you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
Um, based on these three limitations that are spelled out in the call, do you seriously think that they could spend more than 30 seconds yes. suggesting that they would undo it, it, those it, things that it, you want included by your amendment, it, it, um, such it, it, as... Let me show uh, you the language that... Reinstilling slavery and taking away the right of women to vote. And let me things. show you the language that is most concerned. The okay, language wait, states... Wait, wait, before you use up your two minutes to do that, because I just don't see how it can happen, um, explain to me how charging the delegates um, ratification by 34 states and then the very likely lawsuits that the Supreme Court would have to handle in which they would reverse any stupidity that would happen... Uh, why wouldn't these stopgap measures work? Here's why. The language states that it's a call for a constitutional convention for the purpose of limiting the power and jurisdiction of federal government. According to the people who testified, who study this stuff, who teaches this stuff, who teach it at LSU Law School, that that language is broad enough to undo the U.S. Constitution like they did last time they had a constitutional convention, you went in with, a, with the Articles of Confederation. You left that with the U.S. Constitution that we currently have. The concern is this is so broad and opens everything up that you can come out of that constitutional call with something completely different. And all I'm saying is there are some fundamental rights, so, some principles that we hold so fundamentally dear to us, let's make certain that whatever we do, given the risk of opening up an open convention, let's say that here are some fundamental principles that we shall never, ever put back in play. I agree that those should never be changed, but do you seriously think in this day and time, in this country, with this Supreme Court, Let's that make certain. those things could possibly be overturned and survive? With this language, you, you, you're putting at risk the entire United States Constitution that forms Article 3 of the United States, Article 3, Section 1 of the United States Constitution forms the judiciary branch. Representative Amity, the gentleman is out of time. Thank you, sir. For the floor on the amendment, Representative Bacala. I come before you to say this. I stand firmly with our colleague. Gary, I stand firmly with everything you say. I will, I will vote for any bill that guarantees that any delegates we select are severely limited in the scope of what we allow them to go do. I stand firmly with him, but it doesn't fit as an amendment to this bill because, in effect, it kills the bill. Now, we all seem to be afraid of constitutional amendments. I will remind you, and I think all of us would agree in this room, every time our Constitution has been amended, this country has gotten better. We adopted the Bill of Rights in 1791, which guaranteed the freedom of speech. It brought to us the Second Amendment. It guaranteed the right of, uh, to gather. The 13th Amendment in 1865 abolished slavery, and the 14th Amendment guaranteed due process. The 19th Amendment in 1920 gave women the right to vote. And the 26th Amendment in, eight, in 1971 gave 18-year-olds the right to vote. Every time we have amended the Constitution, we have gotten better. I will stand firmly behind my good friend Gary Carter if we draw up a, a, uh, a bill that says any delegates we select shall be limited in their ability to vote, but again, it does not fit in this bill. Basically, any amendment kills this bill. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that, uh, I hope that you'll agree with me. We, 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 in casting a no vote, it's not a, a vote of disagreement with the concepts. It's a, it's a vote saying, Let's keep the bill alive for the Constitutional Convention, and then let's have a separate instrument that ensures that people that we send from Louisiana do the right thing when they get there. That's all I ask. And I will tell you this, I, I heard the words uncertainty and trust, not knowing what happens. I tell you this, every time we go to the polls to vote, when we pull a lever, 
for a state senator, a, 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 a representative going to Washington. A, 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 every time we do that, when we pull a lever for the President of the United States, there's always uncertainty. And we're not sure what's going to happen next. So, so if we're waiting for the moment that we're absolutely certain about what's going to happen, it's never going to happen. Every time we've amended this, the Constitution, this country has gotten better. And I hope that we can continue to do this. And let's not kill legislation by adding amendments that we can deal with these things in a different way. So, so while I will firmly stand behind my good friend Gary Carter, I will, I will, I will co-author bills if he wants me to that, that ensures that we don't send people with the wrong mandate. It doesn't fit here. So I, I hope Broadwater. that we can. Representative Broadwater, is your question for Representative Bacala? Yes, sir. Representative Broadwater. I, just uh, something I would note. I, I heard you say twice that you believe every time we amended the Constitution that the country got better. And having been here in the legislature, or at least in these sessions, continuously for about the last five months, I would take exception to that. And I'm firmly convinced now that we made a mistake with the Prohibition Amendment. And, uh, well, that so one I was repealed. I think you almost got it all right. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, that was uh, that Rep was repealed. That was the 18th Amendment, which was repealed, and I, I think some people here might agree with you. Representative Jenkins, is your question for Representative Bacala? Yes, Mr. Speaker, it is. Uh, did you know that this uh, bill came out of the committee on a 64 vote? No, I didn't. Uh, one of the questions that came up, and the reason I'm asking you this question, is can you actually restrict the delegates, once they're chosen, can a state restrict those delegates to what uh, we are sending them there to do? It was discussed by one of the constitutional professors that those delegates, once selected by the state, become federal actors, and no state can control the action of a federal actor. Do you, do you know if that's true or not? Well, or? my understanding, and listen, if someone, if someone says otherwise that of, of greater authority than me, then I will, I will say that I'm mistaken. But my understanding is that we, we have the mandate. When we select, we send them with a mandate. But if somebody wants to stand up and say I'm wrong, I, I, I will listen to the argument. Well, but we I, still select. It is us who select. Right. And I'm, I'm not here to, to say you're wrong. You're entitled to your point of view. I don't know if when the author come back up, if he can address that or not. I know that was one of the uh, questions that lingered with most of us on the committee, and the reason why it came out on such a close vote, that was one of the questions. What kind of control or restrictions would the state have on those delegates once they were selected? And let, let, me, let me say this. I think there are so many controls, and because it's so difficult to pass an amendment, no matter, it always comes back to the states, and the states ultimately have the decision making of the whether to adopt a proposed amendment. This is not to amend the Constitution. This is to propose amendments to the Constitution, which ultimately come back to us to, to finalize whether we are in agreement or disagreement. And, and I think when we, when we when we walk away from an opportunity that's given to us by the Constitution of the United States, then we, I think, impede the progress of this country. And, and I, it, we've only passed, since the Bill of Rights, we passed a total of 17 amendments. It's not a process. It's easy. Certainly mu uh, many more ideas have been proposed, but it's tough to pass a, an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative. For the floor on the amendment, Representative Mike Johnson. I'll be very brief. I just want to make one important point. I, I appreciate the zeal behind this. My, my colleague's bride is here in the house today, and so he's doing a fine job in front of her. I, I, I commend you for it. But listen, here's the important point about this, okay? An Article 5 convention is only allowed to propose amendments. The safeguard that the founders had the divine wisdom to put into the Constitution is that the ratification process is the safeguard. So let's say this hypothetical was true, which it is not, and there are libraries of information that have been written on this, libraries of constitutional scholarship that debunks some of the myths that are being presented here. But let, let's just assume for the sake of argument that Representative Carter was right and that, um, it, that it was a runaway, they came up with some crazy idea, they wanted to reinstitute slavery or something. You have to get 38 states to ratify that. It ain't never going to happen, right? 
it's it, you you have this process where you have to have the majority of the convention delegates to propose it they have no authority to ratify their own proposals. It goes through the process like every other constitutional amendment has. The reason we only have this limited number of amendments, you know there are hundreds of constitutional amendments that have been proposed in the last 239 years? Hundreds of them. We only have a small handful that are in the document. You know why? Because the ratification process is the safeguard against that kind of madness. It ain't, it's, it's not... That is not a legitimate threat. We've debated this a long time. There's a lot more that can and should be said, but we don't have the, we don't have the, the ability to do it today. This, if you vote for this amendment, you are killing the bill and you are taking Louisiana out of this process. It's an important one. I have come to this conclusion myself after lots of study, prayer, and deliberation. I'm, I'm a, this is what I do. I'm a constitutional lawyer. I was reluctant in the beginning, but I have come to the conclusion myself, for me, that the overreach of the federal government is so out of control, and it is exactly what the founders anticipated in the Federalist Papers, what they were concerned would happen, that this is the, the measure of last resort. And my friends, to me, we are at the last resort. And so that's why I support it. I oppose the amendment and vote your conscience. Can I respond? <laughs> if there are no other questions on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You have a right to close on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Listen, under Article 5 of the Constitution, you have two possibilities. You have the possibility of, of proposing an amendment or calling a constitutional convention. Once you call a constitutional convention, and the purpose of it is to limit the powers of the federal government, everything's in play. And what I'm suggesting to you is that let's make certain that if we're going to go down this Pandora's box, of uh, open Pandora's box, of starting to mess with the United States Constitution, that there are certain principles that we hold dear and that we shall never touch or never amend. The 13th, 14th, 15th, and 19th Amendments of the United States Constitution. And I know my good friend, Bacala, said there has to be trust. Well, it was a great Republican who said, you trust but you verify. And so the language is what's important. What is written is what's important. So to have an understanding with delegates of what they're not going to do is one thing, but to have in the legislation of what the delegates shall not do is something completely different. So let's have the language in the amendment that state that the delegate under no circumstance shall offer any amendments that affect the 13th, 14th, 15th, 19th amendments that deal with slavery, that deal with equal protection of our laws, that deals with the right to vote, and that deals with the right to vote for women. And so with that, I ask that this amendment be included and that these principles are more important than process. Representative Carter has offered up an amendment. Do you object? Representative Garofalo objects. On your objection. Okay, gentlemen, let me remind you, we're still on the five-minute rule. So on your objection, Representative Garofalo and Representative Carter, I'll let you back to the mic. Well, he gets to close. He, he, he just closed. He gets to close. Unless you object. To, Mike Johnson it's already objected. It's his amendment. Right. He gets to close. So if you speak, he gets another shot. Okay. okay. We wanted to give you an opportunity to object. Just, just, just real quick, members. I, I, we've talked about this for a long time. The bottom line is if we change this, if we accept this amendment, the bill's dead. Uh, the, the resolution's dead. It, it will not aggregate with the rest of the states. That's the bottom line. We can address these issues in the legislation that we pass to appoint our ambassadors. We choose, we decide. I agree. I don't want to touch any of those issues, but this is not the place to do it, and I object. Representative Carter. Principles are more important than process. 
It's more important that we get this right than we follow some other state. It's more important that we fight for the things that we fought for and that we not forget where it is from which we've come. So I ask that you approve this amendment so we can go forward. Representative Carter has offered an amendment to which Representative Garofalo has objected. All those in favor of Representative Carter's amendment will vote yes. Those opposed will vote no, and their clerk will open the machine. Vote your machines, members. Representative Ivey, no. Representative Havard, no. Representative Monticet, no. Representative Wilmot, no. Representative Arms, yes. Are you through voting? Are you through voting? Clerk will close the machine. 43 yeas and 54 nays, and the amendment is not adopted. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. There are no other amendments. For the floor on the bill, Representative Mike Johnson. Thirty seconds or less. I said much of what I wanted to say. We could, we could stand up here and give eloquent speeches, but I don't think you need it. I think all of you recognize, regardless of party, regardless of political ideology, I think one thing most of us in this room could agree on is that the government has grown too large. At least on a federal level, let's agree, the government is doing too much. I will tell you it's doing way more than the founders intended or designed it to do. And so they had the wisdom to put a safeguard in the Constitution. I mean, I believe the Constitution was divinely inspired. There's no way they could have had the wisdom to anticipate all these things that would happen. And they put this safeguard in there. They said, look, we want the power to be reserved to the people. Lincoln said, government of the people, by the people, for the people. The only way to ensure that is to have the safeguard in the Constitution that the states get the final say. And the way that they designed it, the way that the states have the final say, when this thing grows too large and it's doing too much and it's out of control, it's the people's voice. It's us as the representatives of the people in here today that get to make that affirmative vote to say, we agree it's too big, we know there's no other way to limit it, and we're willing to, do, to go to this great length to make that happen. This is our chance. I, as I said, I came to this conclusion myself reluctantly, but I'm there. I think we have to do it. If you don't like the current candidates, the leading candidates for president of the United States, whichever side of the aisle in here that you're on, there is great fear and concern. I think that's legitimate, regardless of who the next commander in chief is, that they will continue to grow this thing, that they're not going to limit government on the federal level. They're going to continue to usurp our authority. And I mean, not just the state's authority. I'm talking about the people, we the people. This is the safeguard. I am convinced that we should take this step, and I hope you'll join me in it. Thank you. For the floor on the bill, Representative Lepinto. He waves. Representative Garofalo, you have a right to close. Representative Glover and Representative Norton, are your questions for the author? All right, we're, we're on closing. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, darn. Rep Representative Garofalo, you have a right to close. Members, I'm just going to echo everything Representative Johnson says. I don't think I could say it any better. And let me say, for 240 years, 240 years this Constitution has made this country the greatest country in the history of the world. It, this Article 5 was included for a reason, and it was included for exactly this reason, so that the states could get together when they believe the Constitution needs to be changed. This is our tool to do it, and I ask for your favorable vote. Representative Reynolds, why do you rise? Representative Reynolds has requested a lockout. Would 20 members join him in a lockout? Lockout is obvious. Quorum call members. When the clerk opens the machines, vote your machines and your machines only. Quorum call members. Representative Ivey is here. Representative Leger is here. Representative Wilmot is here. Representative Terry Landry is here. Representative Begnaris is here. Are you through voting? Clerk will close the machine. 98 members present and a quorum. Representative Schroeder and Representative Abramson are here. 100 members present and a quorum. Representative Garofalo has moved final adoption of Senate concurrent resolution. As many of you in favor of final adoption, vote yes. 
Those opposed, vote no, and the clerk will open the machine. Vote your machines, members. Representative Horton, yes. Representative Wilmot, yes. Representative Ivey, yes. Representative Cousin, yes. Representative Bagnaris, yes. Are you through voting? Clerk will close the machine. 62 yeas and 36 nays, and the resolution's been adopted.